Prologue, the land of Egypt. Egypt has always been a land of mystery and magic, a land different from all others, difficult to understand, apart and alien, yet strangely fascinating. It was the most self-contained of all the countries of the ancient world. It lived its own life, practiced its own religion and made up its own stories with hardly any outside influence either from or upon other civilizations. When the ancient Greeks discovered it in about 500 BC and began to write about it, Egyptian civilization was drawing towards the end of its 3,000 years of existence. The first Greek historian whose works survive, Herodotus, visited it in about 450 BC and found that only the priests could still read the ancient hieroglyphs in which inscriptions had been carved or written on the monuments since the days when Venus, the first historical pharaoh, united the two lands in about 3200 BC. Yet, the myths and the stories which the people were still telling had been handed down through all or many of those 30 centuries and had hardly changed. After the time of Herodotus, ancient Greek was preserved almost artificially by Greek conquerors Alexander the Great and the descendants of his general Ptolemy. It faded under the Romans and was stamped out completely by the Arab invaders of AD 639 to 46. It was only been rediscovered during the last 150 years, now 200 years, when the hieroglyphs were interpreted, the ancient language translated, and the tombs, temples and pyramids excavated and preserved. The natural conditions in any land are often to a large extent responsible for its religious beliefs, the form its civilization takes, and the stories that evolve into its literature. The dead monotony of mud, with the plains of Mesopotamia stretching to the horizon in every direction, gave Babylon her dreary religion of hopeless despair. The breathtaking beauty of the mountains and valleys and the gulfs of the sea in the glorious light of Greece produced the immortal myths and legends of that most lovely land, and the sharp, cold air and nearness of bitter winter gave to our Norse ancestors the brilliant heroic fatalism of the sagas. Egypt is the hardest land to imagine, even from its myths and stories for those who have not seen it. Egypt is the gift of the Nile, wrote the old Greek historian Hecateus, and the Nile, indeed, is Egypt. Except for the fertile delta in the north, a triangle of low-lying green land with sides each of roughly 150 miles, Egypt is the narrow valley of the Nile, a cleft in the desert running for many hundreds of miles and a thousand more if we follow it up through the Sudan into Ethiopia. Going up the Nile is like running the gauntlet before eternity, wrote Rudyard Kipling 50 years ago on his first visit. Till one has seen it, one does not realize the amazing thinness of that little damp trickle of life that steals along undefeated through the jaws of established death. A rifle shot would cover the widest limits of cultivation. A bow shot would reach the narrower the weight of the desert is on one every day and every hour. Except in the delta, if a man walked away from the river in either direction until he needed water, he would have died of thirst before he could walk back again for a drink. There are 4,000 miles of desert to the west and nearly half that distance to the east, including the Red Sea. Moreover, even in Egypt, life depended on the annual inundation, the rising of the Nile, due to heavy rain thousands of miles away in Abyssinia, modern-day Ethiopia, 
which flooded both the valley and most of the delta from June to October each year and left a thick deposit of mud and silt in which the crops grew with amazing fertility all kinds of corn and vegetables and fruits such as grapes and melons and dates if the inundation was too small starvation faced egypt and many died of hunger if several lean years came together at a time when the pharaoh had had no joseph to store grain in the good years against such a time of want with death always so near the ancient egyptians developed an obsession with death yet not one that seems to have warped their lives egypt is a land of great if peculiar beauty the river shines in the intense sunlight the groves of green date palms and tamarisks shelter for a while each year profusions of bright flowers the cliffs at the edge of the desert notably those behind western thebes glow and shine and fade with indescribably lovely colors at sunrise and sunset and in the sudden cold of darkness the stars shine with extraordinary brilliance in a sky like black velvet ra or as he later became amen ra the sun god was the first and most important of deities and the river nile itself came second sometimes worshipped as khnum but more usually as part of whole principle of life and reproduction which came to be enshrined in the person of the goddess isis but osiris god of the world of the dead was the brother and husband of isis and he was the greatest god of all for all the dead would return to earth when he the first human pharaoh of egypt came back to be the eternal pharaoh as osiris had been a human pharaoh who became a god so each pharaoh was held to be a god on earth who would become a god in heaven in the duat where osiris reigned so from the earliest times the tombs of the pharaohs and the mortuary temples in which they were honored were built of the most enduring stone that could be found and covered with the carvings paintings and inscriptions which remain from so many thousands of years ago to tell us about their lives and beliefs myths and stories houses and palaces were made of mud bricks for the short tenure of the living and have nearly all disappeared but the pyramids and the temples and the rock tombs were built to last for ever and they are the oldest and still among the mightiest and most imposing of all ancient monuments the end of every story in ancient egypt like the end of every life was the stately funeral procession to the rock hewn tomb at the edge of the desert on the western side of the nile there after many ceremonies the body was laid to rest in a safe place until the day when osiris should return to earth and the spirits of the dead come back with him and abide once more in the bodies that had been their earthly homes there to dwell forever in his earthly kingdom of the undying although all the egyptians did their best to make fine tombs for themselves and their children tried always to have their parents body properly preserved and wrapped and laid in these tombs it was naturally the pharaohs who were honored with the finest and most enduring dwelling places those of the early dynasties such as zoser and khufu and khafra built the mighty pyramids for themselves which have survived to be their monuments for 5000 years later pharaohs such as Hatshepsut and Ramesses the Great and Seti I hollowed the vast rock tombs in the valley of the kings at western Thebes, chamber beyond chamber going down into the rock for hundreds of feet. In the heart of the pyramid or in the deepest rock chambers lay the body of the pharaoh enclosed in a multitude of coffins. 
the innermost of gold and the outer of the hard granite stone of Syene, the modern Aswan. With him were laid treasures without number and all his choicest possessions from chariots and thrones to fans and boxes of sweet ointment and there were also the Ushabti figures, little models of men and women performing all the labors of this world, farming, fishing, weaving, cooking, rowing the royal boat and so on. For in the life to come, the good god Pharaoh would live even as he had done upon earth and must have all that had been his by right when he dwelt in Egypt. On the walls of the tomb chambers were painted and carved not only scenes from this world but also from the next, so that he who dwelt in the tomb should know what to expect and what to do when he went west into the Duat, the land of the dead. How the ancient Egyptians knew so well what to expect during the journey through the Duat, no one seems quite to know. Doubtless, there were stories of magicians and others who had travelled into that strange world and returned to tell of it. But all except one are lost to us, and the only survivor is very fragmentary. Though the descriptions of the Duat and the judgment before Osiris can be restored with the aid of pictures and inscriptions from the tombs and the rolls of papyrus, called the Book of the Dead, buried with those who could not afford to have the full instructions painted on the walls. From the days when Menes became the first pharaoh of the United Egypt, down almost to the time when Herodotus and other Greek travellers came as interested tourists, the ancient Egyptians lived their quiet and almost unchanging lives. There were some minor invasions from outside. Once for a hundred years, the delta was held by mysterious invaders called the Hyksos, who some scholars think may have been the Israelites. During the two hundred years before Herodotus paid his visit, Egypt was conquered for a time by the Assyrians and then by the Persians. By the time of Ramesses the Great, that's 1290, to 1224 BC, Egypt held an empire over most of the Palestine and Syria, but a century later, the Greeks of the Mycenaean period were invading the delta unsuccessfully. However, ordinary life in Egypt changed little. The people lived simply and usually fairly prosperously, tilling their fields after the inundation building the pyramids and temples and tombs during the four or five months of each year when the valley was under water and all agriculture ceased. They had a fair amount of leisure, a good deal of it taken up with religious ceremonies, but time also for song and dance and music, and for telling stories. Usually these songs and tales were handed down by word of mouth and not written, Sometimes, if they concerned the gods, which also included the pharaohs, they were carved in temples and shrines. Thus, of the stories in this book, the prince and the sphinx is preserved in hieroglyphs cut into a slab of stone in the tiny temple between the paws of great sphinx at Giza. The story of the great queen, Hatshepsut, may be read on the walls of her temple, Dar el Bahari at Western Thebes. The princess and the demon on a sandstone tablet found in the temple at Khonsu at Thebes and now in Paris. And Hanum of the Nile is carved on the rocks at Elephantine. Ra and his children, Horus the Avenger, and many of the descriptions in the land of the dead are pieced together from carvings and inscriptions in the Pyramid of Zosa, the tombs of Seti I and Ramesses II and III, the Temple of Horus at Edfu, the Book of the Dead and the other papyrus sources buried with those who could not afford to have this guide to the land of the dead carved or painted on the walls of their tombs. 
Similar sources give fragments of the story of Osiris, but it so happens that the Greek historian and essayist Plutarch, who lived in the first century AD, told the whole legend in his treatise concerning Isis and Osiris, the reliability of which is proved by the very early inscriptions at Abydos and elsewhere. Most of the tales of magic and adventure were written or written down during the last 2000 years of ancient Egypt. The Golden Lotus and the Teta the Magician come from the West Papyrus, now in Berlin, which is thought to have been written during the 12th dynasty at 2000 to 1785 BC. The tale of the two brothers was probably written by Anna, the favorite scribe of Pharaoh Seti II, about 12,000 BC. The peasant and the workman appears in several defective papyri of uncertain date which can be pieced together to make one complete version. The story of the shipwrecked sailor is also very early and may even date from the 12th dynasty though experts differ about the age of the papyrus which is now in Moscow. See Osiris and the Sealed Letter, The Book of Thought, The Adventures of Sinewe and The Taking of Joppa are all from late manuscripts written after about 715 BC when demotic writing superseded the old hieroglyphs but of course they are probably much older than the date at which the surviving copies were written and perhaps go back to the 19th or 20th dynasties the period following the golden age of Ramesses the Great. The last three stories are preserved only in Greek versions. The story of the Greek princess was first told in Greek by Stesichorus circa 600 BC, of whose works only fragments remain. It is given several chapters by Herodotus and was used as the basis for a play by Euripides, but the basic story was obviously Egyptian, for the Greeks could not understand at all about the princesses Ka or Dabal, which appears nowhere else in Greek myth or legend. This Egyptian origin was clearly recognized by writer Hegid and Andrew Lang who made use of some of the story in their fine romance of the days of Marnetta, son of Ramesses the Great, The World's Desire, and Hegid made better use still of the Ka in his Morning Star, which is one of the best recreations of ancient Egypt ever written. The Treasure Thief was told to Herodotus during his visit to Egypt, and he included it in his history. As for the girl with the rose-red slippers, the earliest version of the Cinderella story, Herodotus certainly knew of Rotophis, who was almost his contemporary, though he confused her with an earlier adventurous queen, but the full tale was given by another Greek, Alien, in his Varia Historia in the 3rd century AD. And so, these tales of ancient Egypt represent a written literature of over 2,000 years, stretching back to more than 4,000 years ago, and perhaps as much as 5,000 if we assume that the tales of the gods were handed down by word of mouth from the days of the first pharaohs until Zosa and his successors began to carve them in hieroglyphs on the walls of tomb chambers and the temples. The best of the relatively few that remain out of the distant age have been recollected here and retold. The oldest stories in the world, yet most of them st stories that never grow old in themselves, though their dress may have the charm of age and distance, stories that catch for us an echo out of that incredibly distant past, that bring us bright, tantalizing glimpses from the lost world of ancient Egypt. The murmur of the fallen creeds, like winds among the wind-shaken reeds along the banks of